Hey there, team. Chemistry Coach coming at you again. Are you ready for measuring heats of reaction? Using calorimetry, right? So we're going to do bond calorimetry and then coffee cup calorimetry, and then we'll look at some theoretical ways to determine these things. So bond calorimeters, that looks like a mess. That took a long time to draw. Not my strong point, so I'm like, oh, trying to <laughs> just get... There's not a ton of pieces, although when you're in lab, all you see is this giant steel container. Right, it's like when you look at your car, you see the steel by you don't see the engine underneath, you got to open up the hood to see all the moving parts. So, when you walk in, when I ran this my junior year in PCAM, you know, we walked in, we're like, Ooh, we gotta do the bomb calorimeter, just the name. You're like, Woohoo, bomb calorimeter, what are we gonna do with this? And you're like, Well, that looks really boring. It's just this table with this gigantic, heavy, it looks like a steel safe or something, and you know, some wires coming out of it, and a thermometer sticking out, and whatnot. Well, it's a heavy, heavy steel, right? So this is made of steel. Usually double walled and very thick because we're going to be running combustion reactions. This is mainly used for combustion. You're not just firing the hole. <laughs> You're like, yay. So that thing has a set constant volume. Right? That's one of the key things right here about a bomb calorimeter. It's this heavy steel container with a constant volume. All right? It's going to cost you some money to get constant volume there. So it's an isolated system, right? So there can be, we're going to call this a system. So there's no heat flow between the system and the surroundings here. So if we've got, and usually combustion reactions are exothermic, which means the temperature is going to start at some initial and then boop, go up. And a lot of times they use a special thermometer that goes to two decimal places rather than one. Most of the time in undergraduate, you know, when you've got a thermometer, the absolute uncertainty is just going to be to one decimal place. But when you're using a bomb calorimeter, I mean, you're spending a lot of money for this puppy from the manufacturer. Hopefully they include a nice thermometer that's a nice expensive one that's to two decimal places, <laughs> right? Gives us another significant digit in our calculations. So inside this bomb, it's an isolated system, right? Temperature will probably go up because we're going to be, you know, burning or combusting mostly fossil fuels of some kind, some kind of hydrocarbons or something. And again, the heat flow from the reaction is equal to the heat flow of the calorimeter. And what we're going to do, because it's an isolated system, we're going to measure the temperature increase. And then the energy it would take to restore it to its initial temperature would be the heat of reaction. So we put a little negative sign there, right? Yeah, first law of thermodynamics, pretty straightforward. Sometimes people will say, hey, this is the system, the calorimeter is the surrounding. So you'll see system surroundings. You know, that's, that's loose terminology there, but technically we should do this. I'm okay either way. Uh, and since we're at constant volume, right, the heat flow, uh, and we're going to put a constant volume here is equal to the change in internal energy, which is equal to delta H because there's no work being done. And since we're mainly doing combustions, we can call delta H reaction delta H combustion specifically. All right, so now that we kind of know what's happening here, let's look at the bomb itself. So we got this thick steel container. Inside is the bomb, right? It's the da bomb. <laughs> okay. And so inside this bomb, we got a little plate with our, we put our reactants in there so we can measure the mass, hopefully with an analytical balance or something to four decimal places. Uh, some reactants. So that's probably some hydrocarbons, some kind of fossil fuel, something like that. That combusts. So we fill that up with oxygen and we got a couple of lead wires come out for the ignition. Ignition wire, fire in the hole. Psst. Send a little electrical pulse and <laughs> we combust it. You know, excess oxygen, of course, make sure that your uh, reactance is the limiting, it, the, the solid is the limiting reactant there. This is filled with deionized water. Okay, so we know information on that. We've got a little sealed port here with a stirrer, right? So when it, when the reaction goes and it, obviously it's an exothermic, it's a combustion, it's going to start heating up the water. So we have a stirrer to make sure we don't have any, you know, like a localized you know, increased heat just in a local area because we're not, you know, circulating the water. So make sure that's circulating around. And then we've got another sealed port with a thermo one of those special thermometers in there so we can measure the initial and final temperatures to get delta T. So what we're going to look at is how do we get information from this to determine the heats of combustion, right? A constant volume. Well, we need some information on specific heats, and we're going to find out. We're going to use something called the heat capacity, because this thing comes from the manufacturer, it's not going to change, right? As long as you use the same amount of water, all that kind of stuff, well, the mass will be constant. 
the, the, you know, the, the bomb will be constant. So we, we, it turns out we can combine the mass and the specific heat, the MS, and just call that heat capacity. I showed you that before. So that's given to us by the manufacturer. It's measured. So they provide us this heat capacity. Makes our lives real easy. The calculations for this are a piece of cake, and it's a ton of fun, although technically a little boring. You know, it's like hit the button. You don't really see or hear anything, <laughs> right? Just see this big steel container. But inside, there's a lot of fun stuff going on. So let's take a look at if we ran something in a laboratory, how can we get, let's take a specific reactant, right? Let's take some kind of hydrocarbon or something. Uh, and then let's combust it. We need the initial temperature, final temperature. We need the heat capacity from the manufacturer of the bond calorimeter. And we'll be able to calculate the heat of reaction, which is typically, you know, um, we'll do it in, it'll, we'll measure it in kilojoules, but typically we want in kilojoules per mole. So we're going to need the mass of the reactants. And we just take that kilojoules divided by the mass, convert mass to moles. You're off to the races. Let's do one. You're going to see how simple these are. It's great. We got a mouthful here. You ready? <clears throat> Typical example. Looks like a lot, but it's not going to be too bad. So we've got some bomb calorimeter from a manufacturer, right? Filled with a certain amount of water. Everything set. It's got the stir. It's got the ignition wires. It's got the you know combustion chamber in there, and etc. We put some sample in it. But we look in the manual, and it's provided a heat capacity of 11.3 kilojoules per degree Celsius. So each bomb calorimeter will have its own unique value, right? Based on how it's manufactured, and that's probably that's measured, hopefully, by the manufacturer. And we have the temperature. We, like I said, we fill it up with some water, get everything ready to go, got the sample in there. Boom. Measure the initial temperature. We got one of those nice, special, expensive thermometers, good at the hundreds place. And it's at 21.41 degrees Celsius, right? It doesn't matter what that is, right? We're measuring a temperature change here. So let's say we put 1.4432 grams of heptane in there. So we measured that with an analytical balance. And fire in the hole, hit the button, bzz, woo, right? A lot of stuff going on, but to, but to us in lab, we see this big metal thing. We hit the button, and this is what we hear. See anything, anything happen? No, I still see the big metal container, right? <laughs> but there's a lot of stuff going on, and then all of a sudden, we see the temperature go, woo! Look at that little stirs going, right? That exothermic reaction is releasing heat. It's an isolated system, so the temperature's going up. And the temperature rises to 25.53 degrees Celsius. Not, you know, nothing to call mom, you know, call uh, mom about, but hey, rock and roll. What's the heat of combustion for heptane in kilojoules per mole, right? So we need the mass of it to get per moles. So remember from the first law of thermodynamics, um, normally if it's an open system, the, you know, Q surroundings equals negative Q system, right? The same value, but uh, the negatives in sign. But in this case, it's isolated, so we have to theoretically go, okay, what, what energy does it take to get back to the initial temperature of that system? So in this scenario, Q reaction, right? We did this on the other board, is equal to negative Q of the calorimeter. What? Um, and normally when we do Q, we do Q equals MS delta T. But since the mass and the specific heat are constant of the calorimeter in this scenario, remember from the light, later, later video, when you take M and S together and they're constant, right, for that calorimeter, That's what we use for the bomb calorimeter. So that capital C is the heat capacity of 11.3 kilojoules per degree Celsius. So you just multiply it by the temperature change in degrees Celsius and you get kilojoules. Hey, and that negative sign's there because we're restoring the system back to its initial temperature right on. And since we know that this is uh, at constant volume, so we know that delta H combustion in this case is equal to the heat of reaction, right, which is Q at constant volume, that should be this value right here. Okay, so Q reaction is the heat of combustion. There we go. So we already know C, that was given. Do we know, we know the initial and final temperature, so take final minus initial, pop that in there. So two steps, do the temperature change first, and then let's calculate the uh, 
heat of combustion. This will be in kilojoules, and then we'll have to figure out how many moles of heptane we had and divide it by that. So I'm out of room, but if you can pause, go ahead and pause this and do it, right? So calculate the temperature change in degrees Celsius, multiply it by the specific heat, get the kilojoules, right? Divide that by the mass of the heptane, that would give you kilojoules per gram of heptane, right? And then convert uh, grams to moles of heptane using the molar mass of heptane. So we'll need our trusty periodic table, right? So we know that carbon is the 12.011 and the hydrogen is 1.00794. And if you don't know the formula for heptane, oh no, <laughs> you're in trouble. So remember, for a hydrocarbon, it's CNH2N plus 2. So hept is 7, right? So 7 times 2 is 14 plus 2 is 16. So is that C7H16? Something like that. Oh, give it a shot and see if you get what I get. So I'm going to set it up on the next board for you. All right, hopefully I did my, my math right. A lot of times I'll set things up when I was a student. I'd set everything up right, and then I'd, like, screw up the calculator. I'd be like, well, because you're in a hurry, and, like, and you, like, try to hit like 525 and you just hit 55 because the two doesn't hit or you roll over and you get one extra digit like darg <laughs> and a lot of times on test, on test you don't have enough time to check your answers it's a bummer i'm like i knew what i was doing minus two all right here we go first thing i'm going to do is calculate that temperature change so i know my final temperature was 25.53 degrees celsius my initial was 21.41 boop boop subtract those Limited by um, largest absolute uncertainty or fewest decimal places. So both go to 2. So I got 4.12 degrees Celsius. Yeah, nothing to scream for joy about, but boy, it went up a little bit. So, you know, there's some error in reading that in the lab, obviously. Um, so delta H combustion, which we got from the first law of thermodynamics, is the negative of the Q of the calorimeter, which was the heat capacity times the temperature change. Well, so there's your negative sign because we're restoring the system back to its initial temperature. Um, and we were given the heat capacity of 11.3 kilojoules per degree Celsius. Let's multiply that by its temperature change, 4.12 degrees Celsius. We got three significant figures in the heat capacity, three significant figures in the temperature change. That's why we need that uh, special thermometer. Otherwise, we would be stuck to one decimal place and two sig fig. Ugh, that extra sig fig is going to cost you some cash, my friend. So I get negative 46.556 kilojoules, good to three significant figures because we're multiplying. Now here... Right? And the temperature change we're subtracting in the heat of combustion, we're multiplying two different sets of rules, right? So we got to do those in separate steps. Um, now, that would just be the energy change for that particular reaction that's going up. But if we want it per mole of heptane, well, we got to divide that by the grams and kilojoules per mole, divided by the 1.4432 grams of heptane. So probably could have used, that's more sig figs than we needed, probably could have used a top loader and gotten that to, you know, three sig figs probably would have been fine, right? But hey, not that it takes much more time to weigh something on the top loader versus analytical balance. And again, heptane was C7H16. So if you take the carbon, which was the 12.011, right? Depending on the periodic table you use. If you're in my class, make sure you use my periodic table. That's good to three decimal places. So take 12.011 times 7 plus 1.00794 times... 16, and that's good to more decimal places. So the carbon limits us to three decimal places. So I get 100.2404 grams of heptane per mole, good to the three decimal places. So that gives me six sig figs in the molar mass, uh, one, two, three, four, five sig figs in the mass of the heptane, but only three in the energy. The, the darn heat capacity and temperature change limited us. Since we're multiplying and dividing, we're limited by fewest sig figs, so we're good to three. So I get negative... 3,232.4 kilojoules per mole. But if that's good to three sig figs, is it closer to 3,230 or 3,240? Well, that's less than five, right? So it's closer to 3,230. So it would be negative 3,230 kilojoules per mole for the rounded value. And negative because it's an exothermic process. The temperature of the system went up. That's how you do bomb calorimer. So not too bad. So watch out. Sometimes it just asks for the energy. Sometimes it asks for it in kilojoules per mole. So you need the amount of the substance that you're combusting. But not too bad, right? You can do it. Now, of course, I can flip this and I can say, hey, um, you know, this, here's the heat capacity. Um, here's the energy change. What was like the initial temperature or what temperature would it go up to if this much energy was released? 
you know, yada, yada, yada. So you've got the initial final temperatures. Um, you've got the amount of the substance, right? I can have, I can say, well, how many grams of heptane would have given off, right, that amount of heat? Or maybe it's an unknown uh, heat capacity, the calorimeter. So give you the initial final temperatures, give you the energy, give you the mass, you could calculate the heat capacity. All right, so any one of those variables I could have you solve for. But most of the time, we're solving for the heat of combustion of something that undergoes combustion. Hey, let's look at coffee cup calorimeters. Similar, but they've got their twists.